name is Rebecca Metter, and I am a professor of music here at Washburn University, where I teach flute and music theory. I'm so glad that you have joined me today because we will be working on the KMEA Honor Band Audition Music. And that, of course, is the Concerto Number no. 1 by Mozart, and it is in G major, and it is the Rumpel edition. We will concentrate on the first and second movements, first and second movements, uh, specific to those excerpts that have been published. I invite you to make sure that you have a pencil and that you also uh, have your music in front of you. And you are, of course, welcome to uh, have your flute out and play along and try some of these um, ideas with me. So let's go ahead and get started. Whenever you're preparing for a piece, it's really important to remind yourself of some sort of preparation steps uh, before you start. There are a variety of these concepts that I would like you to consider for yourself. So number one, I want you to really think about your posture while you're playing. Posture while you're playing. Specifically, when I uh, work with various flute players, sometimes I see that they're trying so hard that they actually bring themselves to the flute, and so they start to strain their neck whilst they're playing. So instead, I want you to make sure that the flute comes to you. The flute's always coming to you. You are not going to the flute and that your head is not going to be going forward because that'll impact your tone quality and that'll also impact your breathing. So be careful with that. So posture, number one, posture. Number two, I would like for you to also consider that you're trying to create a resonating cavity when you're playing. So you want to keep your teeth nice and open, right? Open teeth, open nose, raised soft palate, all concepts for you to think about and uh, try and just, you know, you'll try it. Um, when you are thinking about your breath, when you take a breath, you're gonna think about a nice low supported breath. And then when the air comes out, think warm air. I'd also like to mention though, you don't wanna force your air. Don't push the air and then suddenly become tight in the embouchure. So relax, relax. So, and then out. Right, okay. Um, also, there are some sort of practical things that I really want you to think about. And that is this first movement. It would really be beneficial if you would practice the G major scale, the D major scale, and the A major scale. And not only, not only would I do those in uh, scale patterns, I'd also do them in thirds for you as well, in thirds. And as you look ahead, you can see where that would be actually very, very beneficial for you. Also, remember, when you are playing your scales, I would like you to be in front of a mirror so that you can watch your fingers while you're playing and you're gonna be looking for your fingers to be close to the keys. You don't want your fingers to be far away from the keys, close to the keys, this will help you with your technique. So remember, your right hand's gonna be relaxed, it comes to the flute, in essence it's sort of pushing forward here, and fingers are close to the keys. That will help a great deal. Uh, also, I want to make sure that you look at the pieces, the first and second movements, Look at all the markings. Those markings are really important because they inform you of how you might be playing these various excerpts. And then again, the metronome. The metronome is very important for us. Uh, I have chosen to play this at quarter note equals 108, just something sort of moderate today. I would invite you not only to do that, maybe even go a little bit faster, but you probably have various spaces in this composition to where you might wanna work on the eighth note level so that you're not crushing those 16th notes. And I will go over that in just a matter of minutes. So a little bit of metronome work. All right, let's take a moment and apply some of these ideas to our excerpts. The first excerpt that I will concentrate on is measures 31 through 44. The first thing I'd like to point out is that the second beat of measure 31, this is a dotted eighth note and then a 16th. 
So I'd like you to think about breaking that up. So to eat and uh, right? To eat and uh. Also, I have to also mention that I want you between 31 and 32 to make sure that those D's are connected. So the second D, that the D that is actually in measure 32, really comes out of that D5 that's in 31. So you'll support, you won't make too many changes, right? And those Ds will be connected. Here's another interesting thing to think about. And that is that I know we all try really hard, right? We try really, really hard. Sometimes this comes out as bouncing or hitting the notes. And I want to caution you against this. So again, I would like you to be in front of the mirror so you can see if you might be getting in your own way. Sometimes this bouncing does occur. And if you're doing this, this interrupts the air, and this actually can impact the breathing. It can also impact the, um, the rhythm. So be honest with yourself. Take a look in the mirror. See if you might be sort of hitting the notes or conducting something, OK? And instead, replace it with, instead, maybe a smooth line for yourself. Likewise, I would like to tell you that when you do have the 16th notes, which are plentiful in this excerpt, please work with your metronome and work with the metronome at the eighth note level so that you can really be honest with yourself as far as if you're crushing the eighth notes or not, if you're crushing that inner beat for yourself. It's pretty common, right? It's pretty common to hear those sort of uh, be shortened to clip. So you're going to listen to yourself. You're going to record yourself so that you can hear if you are possibly doing that. Okay, so the next excerpt that we're going to concentrate on is still in the first movement, and we are concentrating on measures 46 through 57. What I'd like to point out about this specific excerpt is that, uh, again, I want your 16ths to be very even. So again, use your metronome and be honest with yourself about how even you're producing those 16ths. Also, you'll play in front of a mirror so that you can see if maybe you're getting in your own way. You know, maybe you're trying to conduct yourself as opposed to having a nice long line. Another thing I really want to mention is this. Sometimes, sometimes, when you get to the end of this excerpt, sometimes I will hear a students clip the last note. We don't want to do that. Instead, when you are, when you are finishing a note, you're going to lift. So, right, you're going to lift the note, not stop it with your tongue, OK? It's almost like you're going to breathe back in. Okay. Our third excerpt that we're working on here today uh, is measure 60 through 77. 60 through 77. If you've done that prep work with your scales, that being G major, D major, and A major, it's really going to pay off here. Because as you can see in measure 60, this is an A major scale in thirds. And likewise, in measure 70, that is a D major scale in thirds. So I invite you to work on those. I would work those away from the music. They're, of course, memorized. And that would help immensely then when you get to this spot in your music. So really give that some thought. Also, I would like to point out that in measure 72, this is still in the piano marking, right? Piano. So don't feel like you have to force the air. See if you can just let this float, right? So you're going to connect the notes. You're going to move forward. You're going to think about your phrasing. 
Also in measure 77, no clipping, right? You're actually taking this scale, and uh, if you were playing this with the orchestra, with piano, you're actually passing this part off to the pianist or to the orchestra. So that's why you're doing a crescendo through this little area, okay? Uh, I also really do want to point out the fact that you've got yourself in measure 68, you have a C sharp five, a C sharp five. This is notorious for being sharp on the flute. So you need to bring it down. It tends to be very sharp. So, ah, drop the air, okay? Don't roll, we don't want you to roll, but drop the air into the flute. Our final excerpt for the first movement of the Mozart Concerto No. 1 in G major, uh, I have categorized it as measures 81 through 91. 81 through 91. Again, be really, really careful with your 16s. You're going to work with a metronome. They're going to be very even. You're also going to make a difference in the scalar work. That's measures 83, 84, and 85. So you can have some of this, um, you know, present, right? You can have something sort of present for the first scale, but you really need to save something for the second time the scale comes around because you have a written crescendo. So you want to make the most of that. Also, I would like to point out that in measure 86, sometimes, sometimes this presents a challenge. Concentrate on the lower notes. Make sure your armature is set for the lower notes as you move the air forward for that A and then the E trill. Right? A and then E trill. So concentrate on the bottom notes. Don't feel like you have to make a lot of motion to get both the bottom and the top notes out. Okay? And then finally, you actually have some options. As far as this trill is concerned in measure 90, you can trill with your thumb, so the E and then the trill, or you can actually take a B and an A and overblow the B and the A for that particular trill. You can give that a try and see what might work best for you something that might work best for you, you'll consider it. So let's move on to the second movement of the Mozart Concerto No. 1 in G major. I would like to suggest that you add another element to your preparation for this concerto, and that is the chromatic scale. As you can see, if you look ahead, measure 26, you've got a chromatic scale. So it would be very beneficial for you to work on this away from the music, and then you'll apply it within the music. I think that would actually be very helpful. Also, take a look at measure 11. I would like to really draw your attention to this rhythm. Do you see the D eighth note and how it's tied over to the next rhythm? Please consider how you might break that down to retain that space of the rhythm. So therefore, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, ta-ta-ta. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, ta-ta-ta, right? You're gonna fill in that gap so that you don't crush that rhythm by accident. So give that some thought, okay? Uh, that happens again for you in measure 16. One, two, three, tekata. One, two, three, tekata, right? So you're going to give that some thought. Of special note is measure 15. Take a look at measure 15. You will see that you actually have a triplet in that measure. And you're going to practice with your metronome. And you're going to really be careful to fill that triplet over the beat. Sometimes people take too much time on it. Sometimes they crush it. But this will not happen to you because you'll work with your metronome.
I would now like to draw your attention to measure 17. Measure 17, again, use your metronome, but I would like to point out that you could actually take a breath. You could phrase this to where you take a breath after the G sharp in measure 17, and then again after the A in measure 18. Now, a lot of success can be had in this particular phrasing here, especially if you are supporting, you're really supporting your sound as opposed to forcing your sound or, or um, taking the space in your mouth and collapsing it. So remember, open teeth, supported, singing forward. The other thing I would like to mention is that you've heard me play a variety of these excerpts today, and I would like to point out that I've chosen uh, how to produce some of the ornaments that are printed, and I've done that based off of a study and some experience and uh, working with various people over the years, but it doesn't mean you have to play them like I am playing them. Please speak with your applied teacher and your directors, and you're going to do a lot of listening. So your job is to make an informed decision, an informed decision. And whatever serves you best, and if you know why you're performing something, then I think that's really advantageous for you. So again, you're going to really listen to a lot of recordings, you're going to speak with your colleagues, and you'll make a good informed decision for yourself. As you prepare for your auditions, stay confident. Sing through the phrases. Think about some of the things that we actually discussed today. So consider your posture, how the flute's going to come to you, your breathing, your low breathing. You're going to stay relaxed and open. You're going to prepare with some scalar work and scales and thirds. You're going to use your metronome as well to keep yourself honest. And you're going to practice on a consistent basis, a little bit every day, right? And don't be afraid to play in front of people uh, if that's available to you. Again, I want you to really play with a lot of confidence, and I want you to really sing through your phrases while you're playing. And remember, you will do your very, very best, right? So you'll stay relaxed and focused for your auditions. Again, my name is Rebecca Mether, and I'm at Washburn University, and I'm so pleased that you spent some time with me here today. Uh, I would invite you to reach out to me if you have any questions. I would be happy to help you. Uh, you will see my email information at the end of this video, and I really hope I will hear from you soon. So best wishes with your audition. I'll be sending you positive thoughts.